be encouraged that you're all showing up. Half an hour ago, I was looking pretty scary. Well, you know, food does count. <coughs> and barbecue takes a while. Yeah. When I found out that your clock had been moved to one o'clock, I skipped lunch. Because <laughs> I didn't have time to see you.
Thank you, Mr. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, so I'm pressing that button with the pointing to there. All right, yes. Good, thank you. So, I wrote these articles um, a little 10 years ago. Have any of you read them besides that? Oh, yes. <laughs> They were in the car ten years ago. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do my best to not bore you with stuff that you can read in the articles. But I do have to help those who have not read the articles comprehend why you should care. <laughs> um, that's one of the big rules in the museum field is helping people understand why yeah. they should care about something. Um, display or program or whatever. Um, Newtown is the nickname for the community where my museum is. In the 1750s, a man named Louis Stevens, who was a German immigrant, started setting up a town. He laid out a town. He went to the House of Burgesses in Winchester in Williamsburg and basically got his town recognized as a municipality. Um, and the town is named Stevensburg, but because it was the new town on the wagon road south of Winchester, it got this nickname of Newtown. And that nickname stuck. In fact, um, by the time of the Civil War, it's almost exclusively called Newtown. But Stevensburg is the actual name. <coughs> Then in 1880, the Postal Service started to deliver mail using the railway system. And as a result of that, they started having problems because people would write a letter and address it to Newtown, Virginia. Well, there were 11 of the new towns in Virginia. And there was one other Stevensburg in Culpeper County, Virginia. So what they decided to do is they decided to rename the post office. They changed the name of the post office. They wanted to change it to Pantops. Because it was at a high spot yeah. in, in the Lower Valley of Virginia. It was at a place where um, the Opecken drainage and the Shenandoah River drainage is uh, happening at this one high spot. So um, the townspeople, of course, revolted. They went back and forth with the Postal Service and eventually settled on the name Stephen City. So Stephen City is the name of the post office in 1880, but it continues to be called Newtown Stevensburg. <laughs> so that goes on for about 10 years. And then after about 10 years, even the town council starts to refer to the community as Stephen City. I have yet to find a document that officially changed the name of the town, but today on the map, it's called Stephen City, just south of Winchester. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about the wagons that I discussed in the articles in the second half of this, this discussion. But, uh, the first half, I have to give you an explanation, a little bit more explanation about why um, this town became prominent in, in the, well, in the late 18th and early 19th century as a wagon making center. This is a, I guess you could call it a, a blow-up or a clip of a part of the Fry Jefferson map. It's one of the famous maps of colonial Virginia, but it shows the Lower Valley of Virginia. And um, you can see the Peckham Creek, not spelled the same way we do today. Uh, and we have the Wagon Road going through Frederick Town or Winchester, and then Further on to the southwest. You'll notice the Philadelphia wagon road goes through this area, which is actually um, Shepherd's Town. Um, but one thing that you have to understand is that this area was settled by people in wagons. Wagons were a very important part of the way this area developed. This is an 1810 map. Um, shows a little bit more development that has happened since then. Um, but you can see how the network of roads has developed. 
Um, mainly, though, this is the area we're talking about, Stevensburg. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about Marlboro Furnace. <clears throat> so, there are primary sources that discuss the importance of the Newtown wagon industry in the period. Uh, we'll touch on those. But the one that's probably the most important was this particular article written um, for a periodical called the Industrial South. Just after the Civil War, this periodical was created, perhaps um, to boost the uh, development of industry in the South after the war. If you know anything about what happened during the war in this area, you might have an understanding of why they were trying to recover some of what they had formerly had economically. The author, J.M. McHugh, um, is writing from Kernstown, which is just to the, to the north of Stevens City, or Newtown Stevensburg. And he's writing this article, um, for some reason, it, becomes apparent to him that he needs to talk about the industries that had developed and flourished there in the Valley uh, The wagon train of Baltimore was developed in ancient times through the Valley of Virginia. That's the title. Now this is the article, um, and that's the beginning of the article there, as you can see. This article has, by the way, been reprinted in many instances in, pre in periodicals and also in publications that relate to the area of Frederick County. Um, but it's interesting to see the original and see how the original um, didn't get everything quite right, uh, especially with the names of the wagon makers we'll see. It is impossible to write to you from this historic spot, Kernstown, and not speak of the past. I am in sight of the ruins of Peckham Church, the third on the two acres granted, acres granted by William Hogue and to the Glasses, Gilkerson's, Chipley's, and others in 1745. This last was built in 1790. I am writing in a stone house a few hundred yards from it, built by William Chipley in 1790. That's the house. Um, today, if you drive down or drive up 81, can you at the intersection of Route 37 and 81 to the south of Winchester, you'll get out of 81 and you can actually see this house. It's very close to that, uh, that intersection. The original part of the house is the L edition. The front part of the house was built later. Let me see. Yes, I do have a pointer, so I don't know. That's good. Few there are now surviving who can recall what I cannot but believe would be an interesting narrative of the wagon trade from Baltimore first to the town of Knoxville, Tennessee, and from then, and then from Winchester to Knoxville. Of course, the reason why Winchester comes into play is because the Baltimore Ohio Railway gets to Winchester and basically makes it unnecessary for a wagon to haul freight all the way to Baltimore once there is a train route to Baltimore from Winchester. He said the average time taken from Baltimore to Knoxville was 35 to 45 days, depending on the softness and or dryness of the roads. It is important to bear in mind that there was not a mile of macadamized road then between Baltimore and Knoxville, and the only short bit of graded road was from the Allegheny Mountains near Christiansburg, a few miles of a few miles where a toll gate, the only one on the road, was found. Later on, after they macadamize Route 11, which is basically the old wagon road, they started to put toll gates every few miles to help people pay for it. This is New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Um, the stages were from 12 to 15 miles a day, and the wagoner paid at the eastern half of his drive from $1.75 to $2.25 for the liberal fee for his six horses and himself. And on the last half, because farther from the market, from $1.50 to $1.25, 
Six wagons traveled in the company, and long trains presented a very picturesque spectacle. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is probably the most important painting relating to this subject matter. Uh, Thomas Coke Ruckel, who uh, more famous for painting the Battle of Bladensburg, um, he painted this scene that was outside of Baltimore in 1814. Um, the site where this tavern once stood, this stone building, is now a parking lot for a church. Um, but this is what it looked like back then when um, you, all these wagons and all these people were using it to go west and much became the National Road. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, this is the road. It keeps on going around to the end of the uh, distance there. It's filled with wagons. And, you know, all kinds of stuff, including uh, cattle being driven to uh, But these are the covered wagons that we're going to be talking about today. And this is the route that they took. And this is actually the southern part of that journey. Those two maps I showed you earlier cover the northern part of the valley. This actually covers the southern part of the valley where um, we've got Stanton here, and it goes all the way out to Knoxville, right there. Um, basically, 81, Route 11 today. Uh, I'm sure it must have been very near the first of the present century when this trade began. It cannot now be, ex it cannot now be explained why it was that Villages of Newtown or Stephen City, or in Front Royal, became more prominent than any other points in Virginia or Maryland as identified with it. This was particularly so with Newtown, which for more than half a century retained the supremacy of building and fitting out the immense wagons capable of sustaining 4,500 to 5,000 pounds of freight. The woodwork of the best material was made sometimes by the same man who had been ironed. We'll talk about this later. The pitch in the front and rear of the body surmounted with bows and sheep was such that four or five men could shelter under the projection. The harness is very heavy, the traces, breast, and tongue chains of twisted links and tire, and all the iron use was of the best bar made by Miller, author, Newman, Blackford, Pennyback, and others. Those are names associated with iron furnaces in Shenandoah County and the Lower Valley. Now they cost from $150 to $200. I went to Colonial Williamsburg and we would always get the question, how much is that to, in today's money? And I'd have to explain there's really not a way to do that, um, especially when you're talking about the period when we were in the colonial era and you're using pounds, shillings, and pence. $150, $200, that's about as much as you could pay for a house. So we're talking about wagons that were not unlike 18 wheelers of today, which uh, an independent trucker can spend up to $200,000 or more. And this is the detail of that map from 1810 that I mentioned earlier. Um, I want to point out here, this is Stevensburg, and of course, Marlboro Old Ironworks. And this road right here goes actually up again, and it ends up going through the mountains, the uh, mountains, and then goes to Alexandria. Uh, and this road is today Route 11, was the old wagon road, Philadelphia wagon road. Now, in the early 20th century, a historian who's also the county clerk wrote a book, and he, in it he said, the old Stevensburg gained considerable notoriety as a manufacturing point. It grew famous for the new town Stevensburg wagon that was in great demand by the teamsters who once traversed all roads leading to the south and west, transporting merchandise, Faraway sections. The writer was told an incident relating to this naked wagon. 
an old 49er said, when his company started on that great expedition to the gold fields of California, they equipped the company with the best supplies procurable, and that the only wagon to survive the six months usage was the one marked Newtown Stevensburg. In 1845, 38 years before McHugh's article, article comes out, a traveling author by the name of Henry Howe describes Newtown Stevensburg as a neat and thriving village and goes on to say that there are about a dozen shops for the manufacture of wagons for which the place is noted, together with other mechanical and mercantile establishments and a population of about 800. Primary source. And the earliest primary source is Joseph Martin. Great numbers of wagons are made. Martin wrote no less than nine different establishments. This is a few years earlier. Uh, and that, no less than nine of themselves being engaged in this business, which make and send wagons to almost every part of the state of Virginia, which he's talking about, which for neatness, strength, and durability are said not to be surpassed in the United States. That's a pretty high claim. So, what do these wagons look like? Now, um, I'm going to talk about this wagon in detail a lot more, but uh, this wagon is the only wagon to have been identified by a scholar <coughs> in the 20th century as a wagon made in Newtown Stevensburg. It's called the Minute Zirkle Wagon, and it's at Colonial Williamsburg right now. There's also this wagon. It's in Lewisburg, West Virginia. It's called the Calpin Wagon, and it too has a story associated with it, and it was made in Frederick County before the family immigrated to the Greenbrier, and that um, it was used for hauling freight from that area to places like Hello. Hello. So, um, now we need to talk about the terms. Um, perhaps some of you have noted that these wagons look like Conestoga wagons, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps you've seen these wagons and identified even by people who are supposed to know what they're talking about as Conestoga wagons. Um, I have searched long and hard in the records of Virginia, um, and I do not find any reference to these wagons being called Conestoga wagons. In fact, the more I look, the more I see the term Conestoga wagon appearing most of the time in the 20th century. In the 19th century, and even before the 18th century, we see terms like this. Road wagon, freight wagon, farm wagon, two horse wagon, four horse wagon, thank you, and six horse wagon. The number of horses required to haul the load was actually one of the distinguishing factors about the wagon. Um, now, there were people who started to recognize the wagons that were made in Newtown Stevensburg as being special. And the earliest reference I can find to the term Newtown wagon is actually, once again, later on in the early 20th century. Um, it would be interesting if I could find a period, 19th century or earlier reference to someone calling these wagons Newtown wagons. Um, but I have yet to find that. And it's, I think in part because these wagons weren't only exclusively made in Newtown. We'll discuss how some of them, in fact, were made in Winchester and also in Front Royal. Those who are familiar with the Lower Valley know that those towns are very close to Newtown and Stevensburg or Stephen City. The horse of 6 2 wagon were the heaviest and best quality at that day and could be bought for $75 to $125. Once again, how much is that today's money? Well, it's, those are pretty expensive horses at the time. And that's a photograph of a team, six horses. You'll notice that the, oh, sorry. You'll notice that the driver is on the left rear horse. He's not in the wagon. The wagon is the payload. That's where you're making your money. You don't take up the space in the wagon person. In fact, it's much easier to drive a team postillion, as we call it, from Williamson. They're on the back of that left rear horse. 
Um, you'll also find in Pennsylvania the Conestogo wagons, or freight wagons in Pennsylvania, you can sometimes find the driver on what was called a lazy board, a board pulled out from underneath the box of the wagon, and the driver could sit on that lazy board and drive the team. We don't find lazy boards on Virginia freight wagons, and particularly Utah wagons. Uh, I don't want to. Yeah. Just one question. It's, I agree. I was good in this way you saw it, and everything else. But those wagons had brakes. And how did they apply a brake driving to Australia? Well, when a team is pulling a wagon, the only brakes are the team. Yeah. You put a brake on, a team could pull a wagon apart before it stops. So one of the things that they did, calling Williamsburg, the coaching carriage folks, um, when they had to stop a runaway carriage or a wagon, a team had been spooked, they would have to drive it into a wall. Because there's nothing, there's no brake you can put on a wagon or any kind of real vehicle can stop a team from pulling the car. And in fact, only, only the, the first team can do anything to stop the wagon. So they don't know why they have breaches on. They've got, they've got to go through the, the two hands for the swinging pole are useless to stop anything. Right. So the brakes are actually parking brakes. And in fact, the earliest okay. wagons didn't have brakes. What we see quite often are chains that were used to wrap around the wheel. But again, when you're going down the steep grade, you can put a chain around the wheel and apply a brake, a pressure pad brake, but you still have to put a shoe underneath the tire or else you just run the tire into oblivion mm -hmm. at that one spot. So, um, yeah. Your, your team is your break. Okay. Uh, like I'm trying to avoid reading too much because I've got a lot to cover later on. Um, but the source of information that McHugh gets all this from is a 70 or yeah, 70, let's see here, 75 year old retired wagon driver from Winchester named Frederick G. Rosenberger who took charge of the team at age 17 in 1825. Um, the key list of town, new town wagon makers that he apparently received from Noel Rosenberg has composed of the following names John Grove, Thornton McLeod, Jacob Klein, John Long, John Kreider, Moses Barker. Again, the original is Baker, but it's, we you know, in fact, Barker. Peter Keating, William Fraley, Jacob Slemley, no, Lemley, and John Stevens and Abraham Piper. Now, my article, I go into a lot more detail about these men. Um, I'll just touch briefly. This is John A. Grove, the son of John W. Grove, one of the Groves, two Groves, uh, John W. Grove and John Grove, who were wagon makers in the Golden Age period. Um, take a pink, we've got this photograph of him because finding photographs of these guys who were actually making the wagons, not too easy. Um, this is the ledger book of his father's business mm -hmm. we have in the Handley Regional Library, uh, Stuart Bell Archives. Um, very interesting book. Uh, I used it in my article. I invite you to read it. Um, but it does chronicle how the inner relationship between these different wagon making shops um, develops and works together. Um, one of the key things you have to understand is this is not a manufacturing company. There are no new town wagons that are mass produced using interchangeable parts, no water power being used. These are cottage industry shops, individually owned and operated, um, some using enslaved labor, uh, but basically using each other as resources. When they needed a wagon iron, for instance, you'll find it. Um, the Groves are hiring someone else to do the ironing of the wagon, uh, a blacksmith who specializes in, in uh, ironing wagons. Uh, one of those uh, men 
mentioned, Jacob Lemley. This was his father's house, George Lemley, the immigrant from Germany. George Lemley was a blacksmith, and he, in turn, taught his sons and his grandsons, perhaps, uh, gained some of his knowledge through their own fathers. That's in Stephen City. This is the John Kreider house in Stephen City. Um, again, John Kreider, one of the more interesting wagon makers who came to the town in his 50s and continued to live into his uh, old age, um, being in charge of a wagon shop that was owned by his uh, son-in-law who ended up dying. He ends up taking over his son-in-law's business for his daughter to have uh, a living. This is Peter Keating's house, it no longer stands. But, um, this is a ledger page that uh, belonged to Peter Keating that chronicles or lists debts that were incurred by a man named Keith Kennedy and how he, those were paid off. Uh, keep in mind that a ledger book is not recording cash payments. These are uh, credits, credit payments or credit transactions where the businessman trusts someone well enough that they are willing to spend credit and the credit is then uh, kept or the record of the credit is then kept in the ledger book. And Maurice Parker, one of the names mentioned by McHugh, this is his gravestone in the Methodist Chapel, graveyard in Stephen Street. So um, Winchester is also mentioned. We have Frederick Schultz, the most prominent builder of these wagons in Winchester. Um, and we have also uh, some discussion of his descendants going to Janesville, Ohio. Uh, the brown wagon going from Dan to Beersheba, costing $75 and $125. Uh, not as much as a Newtown wagon, by the way. Uh, Frederick was the son of a wagon maker named John Schultz, who was a Revolutionary War vet veteran who served with Daniel Morgan. Uh, during the Quebec campaign. And uh, we also have a man named Philip Shear, who was a wagon maker in Winchester. Um, now, Front Royal, as I mentioned, was also a place where these wagons were made. Interestingly enough, Jacob Klein, who starts his business in Stevensburg, moves it to Front Royal and continues to work in Front Royal the remainder of his career until he goes out to California in his later life and decides that's where he's going to retire. Uh, the Trout Brothers, Isaac and Jacob, both go to Front Royal but serve apprenticeships in Newtown Stevensburg. There's also John Petty in Front Royal that we don't know as much about. So this is a one of those little things you run across when you do this kind of research. This was an advertisement for an auction to be uh, at uh, Mr. Rivers Tavern in Lynchburg. Uh, wagon and a team of five horses, maybe one's missing. Um, the wagon was made in Frederick County, Virginia by a celebrated hand. Who that was, we don't know. Um, but basically, this is one of those little tidbits that comes across your eyes as you're reading a, a newspaper that really kind of uh, gain a sense of what was going on in the period. This is 1814. Um, now, some of the more interesting wagons that are discussed in textual sources um, are like this one. This one was huge. Um, this is a newspaper account out of uh, a newspaper in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, a wagon weighed 11,875 pounds. Uh, the weight of the wagon uh, ascertained at the scales is 2,914 pounds, which makes the sum total 14,793 pounds, or 2,460 pounds to each horse. Um, and they're, of course, talking about how the horses were not made because they came into town. Um, the length of the wagon is 26 feet 8 inches and made by George uh, Royston of Winchester for strength and workmanship it is perhaps equal to anything of any kind ever constructed in the state of Virginia. So, the shops, where were these things made? Um, this is the only period depiction of a shop 
uh, James Lemley shop on German Street, which is now called Germain Street in Stevens City. He was the son of Jacob Lemley, the wagon maker, blacksmith. Um, interesting, you've got the uh, parts of the running gear for a wagon as well as a harrow for a plow. Um, we know that these wagon makers were doing all kinds of work the ledger books attest to the fact that they weren't only repairing wagons and making wagons, they were also repairing farm equipment. Uh, this is the actual James Lumley house as it stands today. And this view here is sort of where the, uh, the artist who drew the picture was, was basically standing in his mind's eye. Because he actually drew or painted the picture in Baltimore. He had left Stevens City or Stevensburg during the Civil War to avoid having to serve in the Confederacy. That's another story. Uh, this is the shop of James Bryson, uh, later the shop of Alfred William Doggett. It stood again on German Street, but the house it was associated with faced on the Main Street. So there's Alfred William Doggett, and a guy named Pet Steele, who is quite a character. We can't figure out what he was doing. Uh, but he shows up in this picture too. There's Pat right there. Um, and we think this is Branson Argenbright, another Confederate veteran who came to town after the war, set up a shop, tried to take advantage of the fame of the Newtown wagon industry. But by that time, the railways had come and basically the decline of the industry was in full force and he ends up becoming a furniture maker later in life and cleaning clocks. Uh, that was the home of James Bryson, later owned by Alfred William Doggett. Uh, now this is the home of blacksmith Daniel Smith, later owned by a guy named William Denny, who was a, an apprentice to the guy named John Kreider, I mentioned. Read about it in the article. This is his blacksmith shop that was later turned into a butcher shop that was now destroyed. Uh, this is the home of Thornton McLeod, one of those other wagon makers that's mentioned in the Q's article. Um, and this house stands on the site where his wagon shops were. Um, now this is the log house. Right here was a brick building used as a smith shop. There was an alleyway between them, and then the wagon maker shop was framed right here. We get this through studying deeds that are in the courthouse as well as other documents relating to the fact that Thornton Cloud was in deep debt as a wagon maker and he had to mortgage a lot of this stuff and a lot of the stuff is described very nicely in those documents. Uh, this is the McClung Gibson house. Um, McClung was the son-in-law of John Kreider. His wife was John Kreider's granddaughter. Um, and later the Gibson house, the Gibson family, um, were the last wagon makers to own the property. And this was the shop that was standing on that same lot right next door. The house is right here. This was the wagon shop. And there's the home of Branson Arvenbright, again with Branson and his son Holmes standing in front. That is, by the way, part of our stone house, the building that we get our foundation name from. And this is Branson Arvenbright standing in front of the shop that he owned, but interestingly enough, it was part of the property associated with a tavern in town. And we think that this was used um, as a building that was rented out to craftsmen to do repair work on wagons for patrons of that tavern. So let's talk a little bit about the economics of all this. Um, this is one of the pages of a couple of pages of that uh, ledger book that belonged to Groves, John W. Grove and his son, George A. Grove. Um, interestingly enough, we see entries for paying debts with whiskey. <laughs> um, we see uh, men who are ironing wagons for them, um, but we see that it's all converted into dollars and cents. Um, the column here, of course, listing the amount or the value of the, of the service and the amount or value of the payback for it. Um, two books I highly recommend if you want to understand the economics and 
the ins and outs of wagon making. George Sturt was an Englishman. He talks about his experience in England during the 19th century, but it's still a very valuable uh, resource. Um, and Rohrbau's The Craft of Print and yeah, Sell talks an awful lot about printing the printers because they were the craftsmen who were literate and wrote a lot. Um, we do get a, a great sense of the way things were happening in the 19th century and in the 18th century before. The main thing is you have to understand division of labor. Um, Adam Smith writes about a pin, how it is constructed or how it is made in the 18th century. Uh, I won't bore you with reading this entire thing, but you can read it as I'm talking, and I invite you to do so. The main thing you have to understand is specialization. One of the things that's happening in the wagon making trade, as well as the gun making trade, which I interpreted in Williamsburg, is specialization. Major manufacturing centers were starting to create manufacturing systems where one person would do one step in one part of the process. So, a person would have the ability to do piecework and get paid by the piece instead of as a journeyman who got paid by the day. Um, so with wagon making, this is the same principle. You have people who are starting to become specialists in that one part of the process of making a wagon. Even so, Newtown Stevensburg, we don't see a lot of evidence of that kind of specialization. Um, one of the main reasons why we don't is because the bread and butter of most of these businesses is repair. And if you don't know how to make every part of a wagon, you won't be able to do the repair work that is going to come your way. And most commonly, the part that's getting repaired are the wheels. The wheels are getting repaired more often than not. But other parts are being repaired as well, and farm equipment's being repaired. So being able to have the skill level where you are able to make any part of a wagon is essential if you're going to survive. Now, even so, um, even in Germany where we don't see industrialization like we see in Britain during the 18th century, they're starting to have elements of division of labor and specialization. And the words actually speak to that in some way. Um, this guy is using a hub reamer to enlarge the hole in the hub of a wagon wheel that's going to then be put on the end of a, uh, an axle. Uh, same wheel here, we've got this guy using a hub reamer. Um, these are earlier images, but the interesting thing is a lot of the technology, a lot of the tools remain the same in the 19th century. So, the decline of the apprenticeship system and the rise of industrial machine age. Um, the economic guilds in Europe, or European guilds, uh, regulated the apprenticeship system uh, versus the lack of guilds in America. In America, we don't see a lot of guilds. We don't see the kind of cartels that developed in Europe. Um, with London, for instance, the London Gunmakers Company started to sanction the subdivision of the trade of the gunmakers into 47 different sub-trades. Um, and it was possible for a person to be one part of the process and still be called a gunsmith. Um, in fact, there was a, a man who came into London from outside, and he was accused by the Gunmakers Guild in London of not being properly trained, hadn't completed a proper apprenticeship, but in the course of the trial, he produced a gun that he had made all by himself. And he demanded that his accusers do the same thing, and they couldn't, because they all got so used to using each other's skills to manufacture a gun that they couldn't. Um, now, with manufacturing of wagons, we see people starting to become specialists in wheels, because that's where the bread and butter is. Nevertheless, if you're going to be successful in the 19th century in America as a as a wheelwright, you're going to be losing business if you don't know how to make, uh, make the other parts that get broken on the wagon. Uh, also, um, the rise of the cash wage and specialization within trades, piecework and manufacturing. And learning only one step in the process of making a product means pay before the age of 21. In other words, you don't have to start an apprenticeship. You just learn the, start, the step in the process, and you can be earning a wage at age 17, 16. Uh, John Hall, working with Harper's Ferry, also develops the water-powered cutting machines or milling machines that make 
mass production of energy in parts possible. And we see that as part of the reason why the decline of the handmade wagons in Newtown Stevens Group happens. Um, this is really one of the best examples of that in textual sources we found. Um, Hamilton Gibson, that guy I told you about who owned that house, uh, he gets this letter um, from a customer who's basically complaining about the cost of his wagon, saying, I can't afford it. Um, the two-horse Yankee wagon is much cheaper, basically. I can buy a couple of two-horse wagons and still have some left. I like your style of wagons very well, but, but cannot purchase at the price as I can be better elsewhere. That was Hamilton Gibson, by the way, shortly before his death. So, the end of the wagon industries in the Lower Valley um, happens to coincide with railways. Even so, there are shops that are still holding on. This is a Front Royal shop, Trout and Roy, Trout being one of the descendants of those uh, Trout brothers who left Newtown and went to Front Royal. No cheap, shoddy stuff about this work, but it's good, honest workmanship and material throughout. So don't be complaining about the price, all right? Um, but the coming of railroads really does it. Uh, one local author fondly remembers a time when the hand trade flourished in Newtown, but railroads put an end to the wagon trade and with it, it's declined, all others decline. Uh, I think it probably had something to do with the fact that the railways were bringing products that were made in the industrialized settings and offered at cheaper prices too. Uh, same observer uh, made, uh, same observation made by an observer in Winchester. Um, the useful portion of our community has been driven from us. Uh, went on to add, since the introduction of the railroad, we no more see the many wagons that used to pass to and fro from the streets, through the streets with goods. We hear no more the crack of the wagoner's whip or the merry jingle of the bells. That's, by the way, something I forgot to mention. That six horse team, they have bells on the, uh, the harness that they use. And those bells will be ringing so that when you're on a narrow road in the mountains, you will hear a wagon team up ahead if they're coming your direction. Um, and you go around the bend and all of a sudden you're sharing the road that you're driving your wagon team on with one coming the other way, you're gonna know about it long before it's too late. Because who's gonna go off the road, right? <laughs> Just a nice picture of waiting two wagons. So, wagons. This is the mini Zerker wagon at Colonial Williamsburg. It's the Rosetta Stone of Newtown Wagons because as I mentioned, PhD from the University of Virginia, a guy by the name of John Whelan, writes about this wagon in his uh, book on Frederick County, or Lower Valley of Virginia, uh, buildings and, and houses. Um, and he identifies it as a new town wagon. Um, it is, by all accounts, and by even, even to the untrained eye, an extraordinary piece of workmanship the ironwork on it is, is magnificent. Um, this is the picture that appeared in Whelan's book, um, and it was reproduced in other books on Shenandoah Valley uh, history. Uh, this is Whelan's photograph that he took the same day that he took the photograph that ends up being published. This, this is at the Minnick Farm in Mount Clifton, Virginia. Uh, another view of the same wagon. Uh, notice this particular feature here and the other photos I show later. Uh, this is a blurry shot of, this, of a, a side view of the wagon, the same wagon. Uh, this is the wagon's toolbox as it exists today. Um, there are, there's a tradition in the period of making things a puzzle. So, for instance, um, rifles that have brass patch box covers in the butt of the rifle. Um, there are rifles that are made so that you have to play the game of figuring out how to get the patch box open. There is a button you think you push, but it pricks your finger. Instead, there's another button that looks like a screw. You push it, the patch box will, patch box will. <laughs> This is the same idea with how do you get this open? 
Colonial Williamsburg, back in the 1950s and 60s, used the Minig Zirkel wagon for programming, and they couldn't figure out how to get the toolbox open. So what they did is they tried to cut a hole in it. Oh. <laughs> and then it didn't open. So they passed it. But this heart right here is the key. You move that heart over, it unlatches a bolt that's inside behind this hasp. Was this mostly done because people are hijacking wagons or stealing? Well, you can find wagons that have an ability to put a padlock on the toolbox. But this, this can't be locked. It's just they're literally using the, the mystery of how to get this thing open as the security for this toolbox. Um, that's the toolbox from a particularly important view. When I was trying to figure out where this wagon was, I studied the photographs of John Whalen that he took at the Minnick Farm in the 1920s. And I started to notice some characteristics in the photograph that reminded me of the Minnick Zirkel wagon. And that was the shot that John Whalen took. And that was the shot that I took at Colonial Williamsburg comparing the two. And I began to realize they were in the same wagon. So I discovered that the Minnick Zirkel wagon at Colonial Williamsburg was the same wagon that John Whalen identified as a Newtown wagon. And I talk about that in my article when I talk about it. Another article I wrote from Winchester Pickering in the Philippines. And this wagon, the Mini Journal wagon, was in the National Geographic magazine uh, back in the 1920s. And this is that toolbox, and this little boy is pointing to, to the heart to get it open. Uh, and this guy right here, that's Frank Zirkel. Frank Zirkel is the son of the man who purchased this wagon from the Minnick family and put it in his farm as the Zirkeldale Museum attraction. Um, and it was photographed there at the Zirkel farm. And that's the same shot. Uh, this is his sister, that's a little girl, and that's his older brother. Um, and that's the postcard, one of the two postcards that was produced by Frank Zirkel, his father. Um, talks about this wagon uh, being built around the War of 1812 period, um, how it was carrying freight to places like Baltimore, to Alexandria, Fredericksburg. Um, this is the same wagon. I discovered this photo uh, by doing research. Um, this is it in the Crystal Caverns Museum at Strasburg, Virginia, after the Zirkel family had sold it. You think? And this is Mr. Frank Zirkel with Mr. Ron Vineyard after it had been rediscovered at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, this is an article that was appearing in the National Geographic magazine to feature how this wagon was rediscovered at Colonial Williamsburg after all these years. Um, this book here is by Frank Zirkel. I can tell you more about Frank later on after this, but I don't have time now. Uh, Mr. Ron Vineyard, though, he was the author of this book, Virginia Freight Wagons. And it's really not a book. You can't buy it. Colonial Williamsburg has it in their files. I had this copy bound by a local printer. But it's really the most important work of Virginia Freight Wagons that is out there. And this is the Mini Zirkel Wagon. Uh, ironwork. Some of the key fe features of this ironwork that help us recognize other wagons made by the same school. And when I refer to a school, I'm talking about how masters of shops train apprentices and also train journeymen, and they in turn pass on that tradition to others. So a wagon that is made in the Newtown School is not made by students, per se, but they're made by craftsmen who have been trained by the same set of masters. Uh, this hasp, you'll see in other wagons I'll talk about today, uh, this decorative scallop motif with the spade finial, very important, the uh, double brackets over the rear uh, axle uh, here, and this is the front bolster stop. All in the mini Zirka wagon, but we'll find other examples in other wagons. Uh, this is a 
chain holder, looks like a leaf. Uh, this is the tongue of the wagon with this decorative motif on it. Now, this is the Kaufman wagon at the Greenbrier Historical Society of Lewisburg, West Virginia. It again has characteristics that are uh, saying that it is of the Newtown School. And I can go into it more, but I recommend my article. Uh, one of the key features, again, is the ironwork. Uh, this employs a, a, uh, a series of things, including this scallop-edged uh, ironwork. Um, ironing of the mid-rail is a key factor. The bolster stop on the front bolster, <coughs> front bolster. Uh, the rear bracket over the rear uh, running gear. Again, those scallop edged motifs. Uh, the axe holder on the front, and the tongue. And this is the only example of the spade finial on the Calcum wagon, but it's there. Then there's this wagon that is at the Lurie Caverns uh, Museum in Lurie, Virginia. Uh, this is what it looked like when this guy got it and decided to restore it. That's uh, Rod Graves, by the way. And that's it after it was restored. That's it after it was restored the way it looks today in the Gray Valley Museum. And there's a, there's a much younger me <laughs> learning about it from Mr. Graves, pointing out features that I was very interested in learning about. But we're talking about the front end gate there. Notice, again, the ironwork. And on the side, you see the words Winchester and Baltimore. Those were in paint that he discovered when he was restoring the wagon. And there I am underneath to examine the running gear. Running gear doesn't survive on these wagons in most cases. The mini Zerka wagon, the Kaufman wagon, and this wagon are the only wagons that survive with their original running gear. Uh, again, the same wagon at Murray Caverns. Uh, notice this toolbox, you'll see it in other examples of the Newtown School, uh, but the ironwork is just magnificent. This is the Waffle Wagon, right here at the Frontier Culture Museum. I did not include this in my article because I was trying to concentrate on wagons that were either very strong examples of the wagons of the Newtown School or were wagons that were most likely not going to be found later on, um, or hard to get to. This wagon is in storage, though. You have to crawl in and underneath stuff to be able to examine this. Uh, this is the toolbox for the Longfell wagon. Uh, this is the hind end uh, side panel. Notice uh, it's got a feature for holding that rear end gate on. It's used in other Newtown wagons. Uh, this is a, a feature you see on Newtown wagons for holding the gates on. Uh, again, that's where that hook goes in to hold the gate. That's the front bolster stop on the Wampa wagon. Notice the similarities to the Minix Zirkel wagon and other uh, wagons of the Newtown school. That's another shot of the same thing. That's the rear bolster uh, or rear bracket that goes over the, uh, the running gear at the rear part of the wagon. Uh, again, the ironwork, very similar. This is one of those things that I told you to remember about the mini Zirkel wagon. You'll notice the mini Zirkel wagon had a leaf motif for its chain holder. This wagon, the Wampo, has the same, same thing. Uh, this is interesting because the Kaufman wagon at the at the uh, Lewisburg Historical Society has this same motif, no spade finial, just a simple round end mm -hmm. finial. Um, the Wampa wagon is an interesting mix, has characteristics of both the Kaufman wagon and the Nicaragua wagon, and uh, the wagons at the Ray, and uh, yeah. I'm going to go through these. That's interesting because this is very similar to 
the ironwork on the tongue of the mini zircon wagon. But this is the Wampla wagon's tongue with ironwork. The tongue hasn't survived, but the ironwork has. And that's what you find most of the time, quite frankly. Survival of the ironwork of no wood survives. And this maybe gives you a reason why. This is the Lupton Bond wagon, which I called the Stephen City wagon in my article because I hadn't been able to study it. But we have since acquired this, these two wagon side panels for our museum, and I've been able to study it. Find out that it actually was purchased at a sale of um, the Bond family farm barn. And just so happens that uh, the man who bought the wagon is most likely a guy named Samuel Lupton. His son-in-law received this wagon. The wagon was then put up in the loft of the barn. The barn had a roof leak. And of course, that's what happened there. Uh, this is the will of Samuel Lupton. And he talks about giving his wagon, spelled W-A-G-I-N, and wheat fan to John Bond, his son-in-law. Um, that's it when it was owned by its previous owner outside of that barn uh, that the previous owner had, not the barn where it was purchased. Um, and those are the Lupton Bond side panels as they are displayed today at the museum, the New Tennessee Center. And that's the barn where it came out of. Uh, the Bond Farm Barn. It is no longer standing. But the house that Samuel Lupton lived in it is. This is the Samuel Lupton house. It's fortunate not to be able to get inside it and photograph inside, but these are shots from the outside. Um, very interesting vernacular structure, by the way, but I'm not here to talk about that. This is the Schrock wagon. I did talk about this in my article. This is in Sullivan County Historical Society, Milan, uh, Milan, uh, Missouri. And I actually did get to document this wagon in person. Uh, this is its toolbox. And these are, again, features of the Schrock wagon. Notice uh, the hook and hasp. We've got this feature that also was on the other wagons that I've shown earlier, the Dawson Mini Zirkel wagon. Uh, front bolster stop. This is the Fultz wagon outside of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Virginia. Um, again, notice we've got this little drop pendant here on the hind end gate. Um, very similar decorative motifs on the ironwork. Uh, front bolster stop again. And that hind end gate pendant in, in more detail. Uh, the ironwork with the scallops <coughs> and spade trimio. But this wagon jack came with the wagon, is associated with the wagon. And it's interesting because we have this name here. We have J, B, R, and then it starts to get messed up because of where. You may have remembered I showed you the home of James Bryson, New Town Stevensburg uh, wagon maker. This is one of those tantalizing bits of information that might point to a uh, James Bryson connection, but the date on it is 1839. Or no, yes, 1838. Close enough. This is the McKinney wagon. If you go to Lexington and then hang a left and head to the mountains, you'll run into a place called Rockford Bass. And this is where the McKinney wagon is. Uh, the McKinney wagon is in some. Uh, pretty rough circumstances. It's hanging in a barn outside or a feed building outside. This photograph was taken by Mr. Ron Vineyard when he was still in Colonial Williamsburg. It was not uh, very well documented in his, his account, but uh, it does have very similar hardware for keeping that front end gate uh, as like the mid circle wagon. What is the wood they use? Which is part of the wagon? <laughs> Tell me. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> so you find white oak. Uh, you find um, you find poplar, uh, lighter weight woods for the body. But for running gear, you're going to find um, you know very dense stringy wood. You know, you're going to find again white oak. You're going to find uh, maybe ash. Um, the pine is used in boxes as well. 
boxes, iPads, and clearly pine are not simple. Again, the toolbox for the McKinney wagon. It's called the McKinney wagon, by the way, because the hind end gate of this wagon is stenciled with the name Jay McKinney. Um, the end gate and the front gate don't match the ironwork on the side panels. It may be a pad, an example of a piece together wagon. That's one thing we always would say in the Benson Shop when we for guns are made of pieces, parts. And you can actually have different parts from different guns being put together in the same piece or being stocked up together on, and becoming a new gun. Same with wagons. Uh, this is the McKinney wagon as it's hanging. <laughs> Uh, you can see we've got bird duty. That's what it's like now. And that's this, this nice hornet's nest right next to the big box. But that's it right there. So that's why I didn't get to that. This is the Winchester wagon, private collection in Lancaster County. Same uh, wagon. Notice the similarities to the toolbox on the wagons that I've mentioned already. This is a New Salem wagon at Lincoln's New Salem State Historic Site in Petersburg, Illinois. It's kept outside. It's in rough shape. Read about it in my article. But um, again, an example of a Virginia freight wagon with Newtown School characteristics. And this is the James R. Thrasher collection wagon, which is now in the Allegheny Museum at Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk. This is an example of a wagon with ironwork that is similar to the work done on other Newtown school wagons, but it has a feature of this mid-rail being mortised through by the uprights. That's a characteristic of Pennsylvania wagons. So the Moyer wagon, as I just showed you the picture of, has these, is a hybrid between a Pennsylvania-style woodwork and Virginia's Newtown school ironwork. Um, this is the Pennsylvania-style way of doing a mid-rail with the um, the upright being mortised through it. This is the Virginia style with the upright going behind it and the mid rail being uh, attached to the outside of the upright. This is the Moyer wagon, once again. Um, this is as it appeared when we had it on display at our museum. It came to light after I, and I did the articles. And this is the way it looks now at the Weary, ca the Weary Caverns. Uh, Murray values and it's in a barn, which is a restaurant. You go eat your food and look at it. Again, ironwork, very remarkably similar to other new town schools. Where are the others? Well, most of the time, all you're going to find is the yeah. This is what we found archaeologically near uh, our museum. Um, there were wagons that were put outside, and then there was um, what would we call this? This is an advertisement. This is an advertisement for an antique shop in Harrisonburg, Virginia in the 1920s. Um, but you leave a wagon outside, you can survive. Uh, this is a picture of African Americans who were escaped from slavery during the Civil War. And you'll notice that the uh, wagon they own is basically one of these giant covered wagons, probably the Newtown School. And lastly, this is one of the things I want to point out. When you say Conestoga wagon, be very, very careful. This appears in an engraving from 1720 in the streets of London. You'll notice it has a toolbox. It has big rear wheels, small front wheels. It's got horses in uh, they're all lined up in this case because they're very narrow streets. Is this a Conestoga wagon? Would they have, would they have called this a Conestoga wagon? No. It's a freight wagon. Mm -hmm. Questions before I get kicked out? Oh, we will. Are there other questions? When I was at Colonial Williamsburg and talked to the wagon master there, um, he mentioned the freight wagon. He called it a Virginia wagon. 